Uh, it's, my name is Peter Photos. I'm Director of Government Relations for the Heartland Institute in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, and I want to thank the Independence Institute for helping us out putting this, uh, this little event on. But um, when we're talking about health policy reform, we need to understand who has health insurance coverage and who doesn't and what the real numbers are. We hear a lot of, a lot of numbers thrown at us. And I decided a while back when I was still in the Senate working for Jim DeMint to kind of come up with breakdowns, and I've updated it ever since. So this is a quick breakdown of who, what kind of health insurance coverage people have. This is the insured, the 260 million people who have insurance. Um, obviously, 58.5% is employer-sponsored health care. That got shot up big time in the 1940s when uh, FDR imposed wage controls uh, and basically said, well, the federal government will write off anything that businesses or business will be able to write off uh, to tax their taxes on on health care. Um, so that's why I saw this huge boom in employer-sponsored health care. Um, individual insurance is 8.9%. It's actually closer now to 6. Uh, a lot of people have dropped individual health insurance uh, lately because of obvious increases in rates. About 14% for Medicare and Medicaid and SCHIP, and then the uninsured is always hovered around 15%. But that 15% is what we need to talk about. There are 46.3 million uninsured people, and I say that in quotations because you need to really break down the uninsured to understand who they are. Uh, the biggest piece of the pie is about 12 to 14 million people. Those are the people who really don't have an affordable option for health insurance. Those are the people we should be helping um, right now immediately to get them covered. Everybody else, as you see, there's 6 million uh, people who are eligible for employer health insurance, but they don't enroll for whatever reason. Um, you have 8.5 million who are eligible for a government program, whether it be Medicaid or SCHIP, but they don't enroll. Um, individuals earning more than $75,000 a year is 9 million people. They don't, they don't get insurance because they're usually the younger folks, uh, you, get, you know, the young and healthy, the invincibles who don't think they need to get it. Um, undocumented citizens, I, I don't ever say illegal aliens, but that's what it is, 5.2 million people. And it's obstructed, but it's another 5 million people for non-citizens who are eligible for government programs. Some states allow, while, med, while the federal government says you can't be an illegal immigrant and have Medicaid, there are some states that do allow you to have health benefits under Medicaid if you're an illegal immigrant. These are 2008 census numbers. I didn't make these up. This came out back in September or might have been October. It's on their website. It breaks it down pretty much the same way. I just put it into a nice fancy little pie chart. Uh, we hear this number a lot, so we're going to start with a little bit of dis disinformation before I get into why consumer-directed healthcare is going to help fix all this, or is fixing, helping fix all this. You heard this back in July, you heard this in September at his joint session uh, of Congress speech on healthcare, you've heard this set on the floor by every Democrat senator in the United States Capitol building. 14,000 Americans per day are losing their coverage. Uh, the uninsured is a problem, but this number is very exaggerated. This number is based on unemployment data from the worst two months that we had in the last 25 years, and that was December of 2008 and January of 2009. Uh, basically what they did is they just divided that number until they got 14,000 people per day. And I guarantee you, 14,000 people per day are not losing their health insurance. Um, keep in mind that people, the total number of people covered by health insurance has increased every single year since the census kept tr keeping track. Uh, we are at an all-time high in 2008, 255 million people insured, privately insured. Um, and then the percentage of the uninsured has pretty much remained the same. It's been at a constant 15 to 15.3% 15 since 1998. That number just hasn't changed in 12 years. Or 10 years, actually. If you go with so what is consumer-driven healthcare and why is it so important to all of us? Um, for all of the hating that we conservatives do on Medicare Modernization Act, which created the prescription drug benefit in 2003. Consumer-directed health care really was the bright spot of that bill, and I'd argue probably the only bright spot in addition to Medicare Advantage. Uh, it created health savings accounts. Uh, we've heard President Obama at the summit uh, not too long ago, back in uh, well, two and a half weeks ago, say that HSAs are not real health insurance. Uh, there is 20% of the insured population that would completely disagree with them. Um, Consumer-directed health care uh, has, has sparked a healthcare revolution where patients have control over their health care dollars and it incentivizes them to seek out more information which forces change in delivery of health care and makes it more efficient, more accountable, and more affordable. And it's been a proven success in several ways. Now the first thing I want to point out is most of this presentation is available in a Heartland Policy Study which is out front, written by Greg Scanlon. Uh, he, a little background on Greg real quick, he was the Director of Research for Blue Cross Blue Shield for 15 years. Uh, decided that he hate, hated working for a massive insurance company and went out on his own and did some independent consulting. Uh, he cites government reports, independent analysis, everything in this paper. 
So all of this is available in there, so if you want to follow along with me, you can. I only touch on a few of the things that he says. He has 10. I focus on the four main ones. Uh, and then I'm gonna, I want to hear from everybody, and we're going to talk a little bit about what ideas are going to fix healthcare. First, consumer-driven healthcare makes patients better consumers of healthcare services. You're more likely to ask your doctor how much something costs when it's your money. Now, a little, uh, maybe I should back up a second. Let's talk about what a health, what a health savings account and high-deductible healthcare plan is. Obviously, I think everyone knows what a high-deductible healthcare plan is, but when you have a uh, high-deductible healthcare plan that is combined with an HSA, you basically have a tax-free account that you get to put your money into, and your employer can put your money, their money into it as well if they want to. Uh, and that money is to be only used for medical, qualified medical expenses. Uh, the IRS has got a big long list of what qualifies. Actually, my colleague John Oderf, who is with us um, from Harlan, we went to Walgreens this morning because he needed some aspirin for pain relief. He has a swollen knee. Uh, and he used his HSA to pay for it. And it actually said it on the receipt that this was a, uh, a health qualified expense under an HSA. So most pharmacies will have that for you. Actually, all of them will. Uh, and that money comes out tax-free, it goes in tax-free, you don't pay any taxes on it unless you purchase something that isn't for healthcare. So if you go out and buy a boat, which we always hear, we talk about buying boats, and there were new con members of Congress who are so obsessed with buying boats, but they usually say, well, people are going to go out and buy a boat with this money because it's tax-free, and that's not true. Um, you will end up paying the income tax plus a 10% penalty. Um, so there is, there are things in there that are meant to keep you from spending that money on anything other than a qualified medical expense. So. That being said, since people are using their own money to purchase their health care, obviously it's more out-of-pocket expense. One thing to keep in mind is that in the 1960s, we spent about half, uh, five out of every $10 was an out-of-pocket expense in health care. And that has steadily declined to only one out of every $10 today. Uh, and that contributes to the rise in medical inflation and why we see health premiums and cost of health care increasing by 7 to 12% every single year. Because uh, we're, spe we're not spending as much out-of-pocket. Um, People who are on HSA plans are 50% more likely to participate in wellness programs. Uh, most insurance companies that offer a health savings account plan uh, encourage you to do this, and they'll actually pay the first dollar coverage on wellness programs. Smoking cessation, if you join a gym, they'll usually do, uh, cut the cost of your premium. Uh, they'll, they'll work with you, basically, on a high deductible health care plan with an HSA to bring down your premium cost. And people are more likely to use preventative care services. Uh, Aetna has a great health savings account plan that I used to have when I was a federal employee, and they covered uh, dental cleanings. You know, it doesn't cover dental coverage completely, but they will cover cleanings as part of preventative care, and you got two free cleanings a year. Same thing with your blood work for when you go to your physical every year, any cancer screenings that you need to do. So all everything that you would need in a regular health insurance plan for everyday Americans is available from a health savings account plan. So don't let uh, President Obama or congressional Democrats tell you otherwise. 